it's Karen Foley here at the Calabasas Library for Authors Night, and our author today is Derek Taylor Kent, who is a very well-known, very prolific, very talented author, and the books we're going to look at today and talk about are for children, middle school, and Grown young ups. adults and adults. <laughs> yes. A well-written book is good for any age. And you may recognize him or his name because he graduated Viewpoint High School. I did. In 96, you said? 1996. 96. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously very successful since then. Did you start writing in high school or later on? I've been writing since I was about seven years old. I was a weird kid in class who would write long stories, never wanted to create a writing time to end. I would even read the dictionary during our free reading time so I could learn new words that would stump reading the Reading the teachers. dictionary is a wonderful thing to do. I enjoyed it. I'd get, I had a whole other dictionary that I had just for me that had nothing but long, weird words in it that nobody knew about it that I would always incorporate into my writing. So my teachers would be like, what does this word mean? I was like, ha ha, great. I was sort of like, stumped you. I, saw, I remember when I was in fourth grade, I was sort of like, I started writing stories pretty seriously. Like I took like creative writing time very seriously again. I kind of became known as like the writer in the class. And when I was in high school, when I was about 15, I wrote my first children's book in a creative writing class in high, at Viewpoint uh, with Mr. Cooper Mead. And it was like one of the first years they had a creative writing class too. Uh, so I was very excited. I had like someone who would read my stuff and could be able to critique it. It wasn't my parents who would just say everything's good. <laughs> <Loved it. laughs> so, <laughs> well, at least they didn't say this is ridiculous. Don't waste your time. <laughs> no, I come from a family of artists. My mom's an artist so she, okay. who like, uh, was very successful. So she was always very encouraging toward the arts uh, with me and my sister. And yeah, so right when I kind of started writing that and I was around 15 years old, and I was like, oh man, this is what I want to do. It was like, write children's books. What made you pick children's books? I became very randomly re-obsessed with Dr. Seuss. Like I loved him when I was a little kid and I started writing all these crazy fantastical stories in a lyrical. I was always loved writing in rhyme and my teacher at Viewpoint, Mr. Cooper, said, no, like you have to start reading Dr. Seuss because you have to learn how to like write in a specific, the right meter and rhythm uh, that kids need. <laughs> And so I was like, I was like, oh yeah, so I love those books. I went back and I started rereading. I'm like, oh my gosh, these are incredible. I reread everything he ever written. And it just really spoke to my imagination. Like my, I think my strength as a writer was just kind of always been my imagination. So children's books really allowed me to express my imagination and build new worlds, uh, crazy characters and uh, I'd always felt like a big kid at heart. I never really lost that. And it's not easy to write children's books. It's like most things that look easy to the outside world and to a person who doesn't know. It's mm -hmm. kind of strict parameters. Yeah, I didn't know that even going into it as a profession. Uh, I started writing my novels and scary, the Scary School series and others I'd done. And they said, yeah, middle... People who can write for that age group, the 7 to 12 year olds, are very rare. So it's a very specific voice and style you have to write in that most adults forget and they lose that part of themselves. Uh, so it's actually a, uh, something that they look for. But you were also a screenwriter. How did that come about? <laughs> I always loved movies. Uh, I've been another thing that's just one of my major passions since I was, I can remember. I was just uh, watched movies religiously like almost every day and I felt like it was always a part of me so I ended up going to UCLA I studied playwriting which kind of led into screenwriting which I knew I always wanted to make movies I was making movies in high school they had a film program so I was uh, just making movies was always just a part of my daily routine regimen as like it was either writing movies or thinking about movies uh, so it's something I've always done in conjunction with everything else I'm just I've I guess people say might say I'm like a little bit dilettante. I do my book writing. But you do it well. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I book writing, uh, screenwriting, and whether it's directing, producing. Like I, you do directing I and it. producing also, as well as you say you're an yeah. actor as well. Uh, I don't act as much as I used to, but in my 20s, uh, and I went to, and in college, I was focused on acting for a long time. It, it still plays into it, though. I just it never 
to me, it's all the same process. It's submerging yourself in the reality of a moment uh, and a character and being believable in that reality. And that's what I do when I'm writing. And that's the same thing I do when I'm acting. You know, I'm, I'm putting myself, my mind you in that character, that in that world to make it, yeah, because if it's not believable when you're writing or acting, it's not going to translate. It's not going to, people aren't going to relate to it or attach to it. You manage to do all three now? <laughs> or, or what do you concentrate on now? Do you still do a little acting, a little play? It's interesting. I guess the different parts of my life, different things have uh, been my focus. Uh, for the last seven, eight years, it's been my children's books that became my focus. But now I'm uh, screen. Now it's kind of kind of molding back into the movies and TV again, especially with my latest one, Kubrick's Game. Uh, is going to be uh, developing as a TV series right now. Uh, and I have another horror movie I wrote, actually, that's also uh, looking like it's about to start shooting as well. So, uh, yeah, things just keep changing, and I just kind of go with it, whatever is happening at the time. Well, do you incorporate the people you know? Like, I mean, I know you incorporated your dog into uh, mm. the, one of the books we'll discuss. <laughs> do you incorporate the people you work with or know? Uh, yes, that's something I love to do in my writing. <laughs> in the scary school books especially, uh, since it's school-based, it was very interesting because I got to base some of the characters on some of my favorite teachers. <laughs> do they go, no, they don't go named. <laughs> what inspired? Like I had a teacher, there's a character in the book, the scariest teacher of them all, actually Dr. Dragon Breath, you know, who's a nine-foot tall dragon who wears these glasses and bow ties every day and may uh, eat a student or two every now and then if they misbehave. Uh, and he was based on a real teacher. He was actually one of my favorite teachers. He wasn't that mean. Did he recognize himself? But he himself? wore the bow ties every day and had these big glasses. Um, yeah, I think they did. I kind of mentioned it. I mentioned it to him. I think he was very honored. <laughs> I laughed. People pay a lot of money to be so, mentioned in books and yeah. movies. My sister's in the books as herself, though, as a student with me at school. I'm in the books as Derek the Ghost, the narrator of the Scary School series is named Derek the Ghost, who's like an 11-year-old ghost version of me who lives at Scary School. Now, what inspired you to read, uh, to start the Scary Books series? Scary Harry School Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter, yes. Uh, I, I kind of right at the end of college, right when I graduated, uh, I saw, I was seeing the books everywhere and I was kind of reluctant to start reading them. Uh, being a children's book writer, I was like, oh, why is this one so, why is this one getting so much attention? And so why is this one being so famous? Like, this is like all the others. It's like, oh, finally it got so popular. I was like, all right, I better, I better read and see what's up with this. And I just fell in love with it immediately. Like, oh my gosh, this is what I need to be doing. At first, until then, I had only been writing picture books. Uh, with the idea from my mom, the artist, to illustrate them. And I was having a hard time getting them published. And after I read Harry Potter, I was like, no, this is what I need to be doing. I need to write novels that don't need illustrations. <laughs> I'm not reliant on that, where I can create my own world like she did. That's just like plays into my whole imagination. Uh, and so that's what I did. And it became, so I spent about two years writing my first novel which is called Rudy and the Beast, My Homework Ate My Dog. Uh, and we tried to get that one published. I got my first agent based on that book and didn't get a publishing deal, but one publisher really liked it, was on the fence, but decided they wanted something lighter and funnier. It was kind of dark, kind of like Harry Potter, like kind of dark and folder kids. They want something lighter and funnier. So that ended up becoming the Scary School series. So I wrote a whole new book just for them, basically. Uh, a light, funny version of the same, based on the same idea, which like there was a scary school involved. And that was the original title. So that's the theme running through all of the books, the scary school and what goes on at a scary school. Right, a book, school where regular kids get to go to school for the first time with all kinds of scary kids, like zombie kids, vampire kids, werewolf kids, and all the teachers are scary, like the dragon teacher, or there could be a Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, or a mummy, one of the mummies from Egypt. Uh, so all the teachers have to be scary. That's the rule. <laughs> uh, but it's the, f uh, the first school in the world where their uh, humans and monsters are attending classes together. And it's kind of like an experiment to see if they can get along together for the first time. So it has a nice message in it of both tolerance and 
acceptance of one another's differences and that it doesn't really matter what you are. Um, that, you know, when you go to school together and you learn together, like you're all like a big family. Are those the themes you like to put in all of yours? Uh, that is a running theme throughout my books, for sure. It's I noticed very, it in the Il Perro book. Something I'm very passionate about, uh, for sure. Uh, my mom was a teacher before she became a professional artist. Where did she teach locally? Uh, yeah, she taught in some uh, San Fernando High, okay. in, which in the 70s, which was one of the roughest, toughest mm -hmm. schools where there were riots and a lot of racial tensions. But she brought everyone together through art. She became a very well-known art teacher and worked even with Jaime Escalante uh, at the time when their techniques. Uh, and she brought kids together with no plans of going to college even. And they were a lot of times involved in gangs and but found that they had incredible artistic talent. So she actually started LA Mural Project with the mayor at the time, Tom Bradley. And they would go out onto all the city streets and paint murals on the walls and got a lot of media attention. Uh, and they got, even got to do murals for the Olympics in 1984 mm -hmm. when that happened. Uh, so all these kids just, just were so inspired by it and all this talent that they, could, they were shocked that people would buy their artwork and they could make money off it, even that they all ended up, she got them art scholarships into colleges. Who Did had she really? No, what a wonderful role model to and, have as a parent. Yeah. Um, so it's just in. So I, that was always a part of it. And a lot of some of her students came back and when she became a professional artist, worked with us at the house uh, in her art studio. Uh, so I got to know them firsthand. Did you do any of your illustrations in the, in the uh, El Perro book or your covers? Unfortunately not. The publisher has their own illustrators that they work okay. with, although she would have been great. But she has done some artwork for some of my other uh, projects before and it's fantastic. Do you go to the same publisher for all of your books? They've all had different publishers, interestingly. So um, I'm an interesting little case because I've worked in every kind of publishing model available. I've done self-publishing, I've done hybrid publishing, and I've done traditional publishing. So the Scary School series, which is just four of them, are with HarperCollins, and El Perro con Sombrero is with Holt McMillan, and Kubrick's Game is with a hybrid company called Evolved Publishing. Now, there's four books in this series, correct? Correct. Uh, do you intend to add to them? <laughs> or is this? I would love to. Uh, I'm working, I've become very immersed in my Kubrick's game world at the moment. But if there's demand, I will always keep writing uh, more books for something if the kids ask for it. <laughs> well, let's take a moment and take a break. And then let's go to the Kubrick's game as our next book. All right, thanks. So thank you, audience. Stick with us. And we'll be back in just a few moments. Stop pretending we have plenty of water. Los Angeles is in a drought, but there are ways you can help. Replacing lawns with rain gardens and California-friendly plants is just one of many solutions. For more info on conserving water and saving energy, please visit LADWP and the Bay Foundation online. Author's Night and our guest Derek Taylor Kent and before we get into Kubrick's game something you said at our last segment a uh, hybrid publishing that's a something I had not heard what does that mean so this is a new type of publishing model that's come around in about the last 10 years that's becoming more and more prevalent with today's market uh, the publishing industry just has been changing a lot and people, publishers, authors are trying very hard to keep up with it and what it means. Uh, most bookstores have closed uh, and uh, Amazon is getting more and more of the share of the market. Uh, a lot of times now there's a lot more independent bookstores coming, so things keep shifting. And so hybrid publishing was sort of a reaction to that uh, where it's a new kind of model. It's something in between self-publishing and traditional publishing. So we'll have a publisher who will do a lot of the things normal publishers do. Well, they will edit the book, uh, 
they have a publishing house, they have a marketing uh, team that will do a lot of the same things that traditional publishers do, but they don't uh, won't necessarily have like the connections with the bookstores. Uh, so like they, for instance, with Kubrick's game, a lot of times their focus is a lot on eBooks and audiobooks because uh, they feel like that's where that's the most growing segment of the market. Uh, so a big difference is that with a traditional publisher, us authors like me, for my other books, I'll get, say, a, an advance and then a 5 to 10% royalty uh, on the sales of the books, which isn't very much per book. <laughs> so it's really most of what I'm making is contained in the advance. But with a hybrid publisher, they'll kind of flip that model around and say, okay, we're going to give you less or maybe nothing for an advance because they're such new companies they don't have. Uh, the capital for advances for all their authors, but will give you a much higher percentage of the royalty. Uh, so you'll get a lot more royalties, which means that your efforts can pay off a lot more. And you have the potential to actually make a lot more money uh, if you can sell your book. Do they do the same level of promotion? Uh, they do the same kinds of promotion. For me, in my experience, it's been about it's been very similar because Good. even most authors who go with a traditional publisher, depending on your type of book, they don't have much of a market. A budget for new authors, uh, which I was uh, didn't know when I first went into it, and I realized, oh my gosh, I still have to do 99% of the work here in selling my books. I still have to uh, just do a grassroots marketing of going to schools and doing two or three school visits a week to get kids aware of my book. I have to go to all these book festivals. I have to go to uh, book fairs, and so it's just I I was kind of shocked how much okay I have to do. Pretty it's much a full all the time work. Job. Yeah, it is a full time job more than the writing. I have to do a lot yeah. more promoting than I do with writing, unfortunately. With because uh, I guess it's hard to reach kids, especially um, as a in terms of advertising and getting them. It's like grassroots works the best. Uh, so I just became kind of good at it. I kind of got a whole model a model for it, how to do it. And so when Kubrick's game came out, I was kind of used to the idea. Now I actually have a, it's much easier for me to reach gro adults. Uh, than I think kids <laughs> through viral marketing because kids aren't always the you know using compute you know websites and phones as much as like uh, shopping for books and looking for new books whereas adults are so I can really use what I've learned uh, to help push Kubrick game forward which is something that has been an interesting little experiment for me. <laughs> Why don't you tell us what the book is about? Is it one in a series? Uh, yeah, it's going to probably be a, a couple more coming out, too. Is uh, this your first one for the more adult grown-up? It's my very first one, yeah. Okay. So it was a very interesting transition going from the style of writing children's books to uh, adult books. Why did you? Uh, I speak to what I ever, I'm most passionate about at the moment. I had that story in my head uh, about Kubrick, and I knew it wouldn't really work for kids. Uh, but I just something that was simmering in my head for a year, maybe two years, that I just, and it just wouldn't go away. So I knew that's what an idea that so I that have to pursue. that was your inspiration for starting this. <laughs> uh, like other uh, books I've written, like I read Harry Potter was a huge influence for Scary mm. School and Dr. Seuss for my picture books. I read a book called Ready Player One, okay. uh, which is uh, going to be a Spielberg movie coming out next year, actually. And... I read that book, and it was a book all about the author's passions, which happened to be 1980s pop culture, which he weaved into a really fun adventure story. Uh, and so I thought, well, if I were going to do that, what would I write about? And it was immediately clear that Stanley Kubrick uh, was my biggest passion, my favorite director. Uh, and uh, I had that idea where his movies are so mysterious and wrapped in mystery and hidden messages, subliminal messages, and conspiracy theories already, that to weave a thriller story around that uh, came kind of naturally to, to it, the subject matter. So the book asks the question, what if Stanley Kubrick left behind a hidden treasure and the clues to find it were all secretly buried within his films? So you'd have to... <laughs> Go see every one of his films. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. You don't even have to even know who Stanley Kubrick is to enjoy the book, which luckily I found out since a lot of people have read it are saying, I never saw a Kubrick movie, but I still really found the book fun and enjoyed learning about him, which 
I think it's a little bit like the Da Vinci Code. You might not, you don't have to know about Renaissance art. Well, this is a real uh, life you, treasure hunt. You learn about it and you enjoy learning about it and then have a, yeah, the treasure hunt that goes along with it. So in the book, a film student discovers this, these hidden clues that are in his movies and finds that there's actually a game that Kubrick left behind uh, for film uh, lovers like him to find something, a very mysterious treasure that's left behind. But it's also made in an audio book. That's right. Do you uh, s narrate? I did not. I would have loved to. But I very luckily got some fantastic narrators, do some who I was such a geeky fan for. Uh, Jonathan Frakes, who is a Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. Wow. Number one. He narrates the book. He's the main narrator. And we even got some help from Yvette Nicole Brown, who was on the show Community and is on the new show The Odd Couple. Uh, I know her from The Talking Dead. She's like kind of the, the mouthpiece for the whole geek audience, especially for the female geek audience. And that's who I was trying to reach out for the most. And my buddy Pete Gersio, who's also a great comedian, came in and did a little cameo. So I really enjoy getting this group together and kind of doing a different kind of audiobook where it's more like a radio play. Is it like directed characters. like a play would be? Or yeah, I got to audio? direct it, which was great. You directed it? Yeah, I got to direct Wonderful. the audiobook uh, recording session. Which That's been very exciting. Going back to my directing and theater roots was very similar, yeah. So you incorporate all your talents in all these different venues in which you go. Yeah, so I still have like the performance acting bug in me from my acting days. So I created a whole show around Scary School where I go to schools and do an interactive slideshow uh, with the kids that's a choose your own adventure where you get to become all these different kinds of monsters and i i do all my physical comedy that i used to do where i throw myself around and stomp around like a dinosaur and the kids get to interact with it and then be part of the story uh, and i subtly also then teach them a very important lessons about the importance of reading and how to become a good writer but how do you promote this one you can't go acting in the <laughs> elementary yeah it's schools. tough you can't really do that uh but you, you do very uh I do things like, you can go to bookstores that are into this. I went to Mysterious Galaxy recently. That has a, uh, their fan base has a lot uh, into these type of books. Um, what's great is, though, is that my audience, the geeks, are all online. And they're all obsessed with their webs, the different sites that they love and uh, all their movies and social media. So I'm able to actually reach them a lot more easily than kids just through social media and viral marketing. Uh, so that's been great being it, that it's able to do that and I don't have to, I can spend more time writing now that I can reach them that way and not have to spend an entire day traveling around to schools. You would make a great movie, this book. Yeah, we're actually working on that right now. They're oh, actually, really? uh, yeah, a great producer just optioned it and we're working on it to actually kind of turn into a Westworld style TV series uh, where it's going to be like mystery, you know, cliffhanger mysteries every week. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Yes, I'm familiar with Westworld. It sort of would meet that whole format. It would be perfect for it. That's what I'm thinking. It was very exciting that that's what they saw for it. And we're just starting working on that right now. Uh, this week, in fact. I'm very excited. So you were involved practically every minute of every day with these books. Yes, I definitely would say that. Uh, it's interesting how it's chips. Like, uh, I'm going to have to be working on Kubrick's game all week in this for the creating the TV series development pitch for it. Um, but then next week I have shows every single day for Scary School, <laughs> right? I'm going to three different schools here in the Valley uh, and going to, so I'm gonna be at the Discovery Cube in Orange County where we're doing, I do shows. And then I have an El Perro show. I'm, I do Skype visits with schools all across the nation where I Skype with them and Let's talk about my Let's take this book because I really enjoy this. I especially liked it because <laughs> it's a bilingual doggy tail. Yes, it's called El Perro con Sombrero, a bilingual doggy tail, which is all about my dog, uh, Xander, uh, who's a homeless dog who lives on the street, doesn't have any family, but then a lucky sombrero lands on his head, turns his life around, and he actually becomes a movie star dog. Uh, and the theme of diversity runs through this book, too. Yes. yes. And acceptance. Uh, it's written you, in English and Spanish, so you, I wrote you it bilingual? for those kids. I studied Spanish in school as a kid, then I took Italian in college. Really? And at Viewpoint, I took seven years of Latin <laughs> uh, with Dr. Levy, who was the, our, our inspiration for the Scary School Seven teacher. years of Latin? Yeah. 
think my husband's the only other person who can speak Latin. Oh, we can have a great conversation yes, together. Yes, there are very together. few of you around. <laughs> yeah, us and the Pope, that's about it. Well, I was going to say, except for the Catholic Church, what made you take Latin? Your love of words? It was the teacher. I had heard ah. that that teacher was the best teacher in the school, and it was true. He was like one of my biggest inspirations for writing. Uh, he, he had written a few books himself and just had the most incredible life. And uh, so I couldn't leave his class and never got to use my Latin except when I visited Italy and could read the ruins. That's about it. Uh, but the Latin was nice because it makes every other language learning easy. Like I took Italian. Italian's based on the Latin mm -hmm. roots. Uh, so that became much easier for me. And Spanish I took a little bit in school, but I had a friend who I worked on that book with who did the translation for me. Uh, and I had actually had the idea when I was going to all these visits for scary school, a lot of the schools I visited were dual immersion. That's one of the most popular type of schools now where they're learning in English and Spanish. It's po school. become very popular again. Yeah. Dual uh, immersion. So they were well, that's why I liked it because it just appeals to a whole other group of people. Right. A group of children. They told me they needed children's books for their schools. They didn't have enough that were written English and Spanish where you could teach both languages with that book. Uh, and so it just fit together perfectly that I happened to also get a dog who loved to wear hats. <laughs> well, I'm all in favor of wearing hats. Is, is this your only younger children's book? Uh, I have another one called Simon in the Solar System, which is all about outer space. It teaches the kids everything they'll ever need to know about the planets in the solar system, which I actually wrote at UCLA uh, as extra credit assignment for my astronomy class. <laughs> and that one's really great. That one was illustrated by a, the most popular YouTube artist named Mary Doodles, and that won an award for best illustrations in a, in a picture book. Uh, now, who illustrated this particular book? The illustrations seem different, different yes, type from your other book. Yeah, that one's Jed Henry. I didn't, never even met him. Uh, the publisher found uh, someone the publisher really wanted. They were huge fans of him. So uh, when they got the book, they went straight to him. He was their first choice to do the illustrations for the book, and he's fantastic. I couldn't be more happier with the illustrations he did for this. So you had the final say on if, if or not uh, Jed Henry could do your illustrations. I didn't have any say. Oh, the any publisher say. totally I'm glad you liked it. Themselves. It turned out they were great. I sent them pictures of my dog, and they captured him perfectly. I'm like, this guy's great. <laughs> I could send them notes if they got anything wrong or something could be different. Well, what kind of a dog is it supposed to be? Uh, I couldn't. My quite... dog's an Italian greyhound. They made him that dog. I think a little bit of a mutt, but uh... well, it's got. <laughs> I can't see the greyhound. Looks a little like a beagle. It looks a little bit like that. Yeah, it could be a. It's a great looking a dog, the big dogs. ears. Yeah, my dog does have those ears. <laughs> but it's a good family book. It's a good children's book. And what I'm in, especially impressed about, Derek, is that you can speak for every generation. Yeah, I, not something I necessarily planned on. I just love stories. And if a story happens to be for younger kids, that's the one I want to, I'm going to tell it. And if it happens to be for the middle grade kids, then I need to tell it. It's just whatever story needs to be told that I have in me is the what I write next. And I don't worry about, you know, who it's for. It's just a story that I feel just bursts out of me, you know. But what is next on the horizon? You're sticking with Kubrick's game for a while and possibly a movie. Is there any... Yeah. Other project you have in the back. I of always your mind. have a lot of projects uh, in the works. I uh, I'm right now working on the adapting Kubrick game trying for TV and yeah, a life imagine. beyond that. Uh, I have another novel definitely in the, in the works for that series though with those characters. Uh, I have a couple middle grade novels also. I did. I have a one called Principal Mikey which I just finished about a ten year old kid who becomes principal of his school. Mm. <laughs> and. I have a couple picture books I also just finished, uh, which I'm also very excited about that I'm going to be pitching out there and trying to get made soon. Who soon. does the illustrations for that? We'll see. We send it out there to the publishers, and all I have to do is the writing. That's what's great. I am a terrible artist. So all I have to do is the writing part, and the publishers find great illustrators who can bring my work to life for me. Do you, do you keep possible illustrations in mind as you write the book? 
Uh, yeah, sometimes I can write notes, and when I do the writing, it's something a little trick you can do, where I can describe what would be illustrated in that motion, in that scene, or little details that would need to be included. Uh, so I can add little descriptions like that into the writing, but for the most part, I don't have any input as to the style or... No, but you, you know what you want to have, and I guess that translates by the words that you write. Right. Yeah, you generally, if, it's, if a picture book is written well, it should be pretty obvious what uh, type of illustration would go with what piece of writing. Uh, that's something that's they look for that I've kind of learned how to do. Well, that brings us to what I said in the very beginning of our interview, that these books are not just for children. Oh, thank you. I mean, a well-written novel a well-written book for whatever age it is, is appropriate for any age. You can learn from any book. I've read children's books and Dr. Seuss books mm. and love everything that Dr. Seuss says. Me too. And I think that's what, maybe that's, maybe you hit the nail on the head, like good writing is universal. And that's why Harry Potter can appeal to five-year-olds and 50-year-olds. Um, and when I write scare, when I wrote my books, like especially Scary School, like I thought this was something that I would write. I wanted to write something that I would enjoy reading. That would kids would laugh and adults would laugh. I wanted to, you know, funny is funny. <laughs> uh, and yeah, El Perro con Sombrero you have right there. Like I th yeah, I think it's just a a good story and something that I don't. I know parents out there, especially I read to my little nephew. He wants to hear the same, have to read the same book 20 times in a row. <laughs> you gotta, hopefully you won't get sick, something that, you won't get sick of it after the first time. <laughs> it's a great test to, for people to go out there and get books, not only that they may not normally read for themselves, which is why I join a book club. It <laughs> picks books I would never, ever yeah. think of reading. And the same way you come to a library or go online, you should... Look at children's books. They're teaching the young what the young need to know mm -hmm. and teaching things that sometimes parents are uncomfortable discussing. That's true. Yeah, a book can be very So helpful. you shouldn't be so arrogant and say, well, it's a children's book. It's not for me. <laughs> because in the world, words of Walt Disney, they say that's the problem today in this world. Too many people grow up. Mm -hmm. They forget. So thank you, Walt Disney, for those words of wisdom. And thank you very much, Derek Taylor Kent. And I wish you great success you. in all of your endeavors. Thank you. And thank you so very much for honoring us today by being on our program. Thank you so much for having me. It was awesome. <laughs> and thank you, our audience, Media Operations Department, the City of Calabasas, and the Calabasas Library and for all of you, our TV audience.